Yes. Okay. I'll just mute. That's all you gotta do. So you wanna go to war with me? You're talking like you think you're crazy. You think that I'm afraid, but I don't break. I heard you question my stability. You think I'm fall just like a kid. All right, guys, happy Saturday morning. In this video, we're going to go through Judge Zern's memorandum opinion. We'll do some chat. I've got some folks here uh, joining us also in voice discord. Uh, quite a few of them. Can one of y'all say hi and let's see if they can hear you on the chat. Okay. Mediocre, are you there? Hello, Tony. All right. Can y'all hear them? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Shin Kiyoku, good morning. George, cancel bubble. Maximus, good morning. Zelly Zen, happy birthday, Zelly Zen. All right, they say they can hear you. Anya, good morning. Timmy, good morning. Bryce, good morning. John's touchpad, what's up, friend? Rambo, good morning. Good morning to you, David, in the UK. So uh, we got our power back on last night around 1 a.m. I was incorrect. It was not a transformer up on a pole. Uh, I don't even know why I thought that, because we don't have above ground power here except on the fringe of the neighborhood. We have those uh, transformers that are on a pad, a concrete pad. So uh, they pulled up with a big ass truck. I posted a picture of it on Twitter. A uh, big ass truck and a new transformer late last night and they finished up around 1 a.m. They had to take my gate off, drive a forklift into the backyard at midnight, lift it over the fence into the neighbors and then pull out the old transformer and put in a new one. So. <laughs> Around 1.30 in the morning last night, I finally got AC back on and internet working again. Anyways, glad that is done and we all survived. Anything goes, good morning. Tony S, what is up? Chrismo, good morning. Jay Evans, JM, beautiful people. Lots of UK folks here, welcome. So let's put this memorandum on the screen and yes this is not the final judgment so next week one day probably early you'll see the judge enter a final judgment uh, i don't know what day i might be early it might be 10 days from now but there will be a final judgment where uh, you'll see that words those words final judgment that will be it but in the meantime we got 111 pages or so here to read up Look, the, the settlement is agreed upon. If we go to the last page, you guys already know that by now. The settlement is approved. So uh, at this point, you know, really I want to see what she has to say because we've all been sharing our own thoughts in our DD. Obviously uh, a wide variety of opinions on what was going to happen. And uh, I've been doing my best to share my thoughts with you here on this channel that the settlement would be approved that uh, although I agree and understand, agree with and understand what a lot of the, the other side of, you know, the, the Ethans and the Al's and such, uh, I, I understand their passion. I don't think that they were reading the law correctly, in my opinion. And the special master kind of gave us a hint about that early on. The plaintiffs and the defendant both were, uh, trying to get this settlement done, and it just seemed inevitable that the judge would approve it. So that's what I've been trying to convey to you guys over the last many weeks and months. And here we are with a, a settlement approved, just waiting the, the final judgment now. Steven, what's up? All right. 
So let's see what she has to say. I have not read this yet, other than this very first page and the very last page. And I, I don't know if we'll sit here for an hour and read every single bit of it, but I'm going to be picking out parts that uh, I think are interesting. We'll just have a chat. I'm, I'm rehydrating with water this morning <laughs> after last night's scotch. And, uh, and uh, I'll be bouncing back and forth between the document, your comments, which I can see them all t today as I couldn't see them last night. And uh, you guys in the Discord chat, feel free, feel free to uh, weigh in with your thoughts and question in the voice also. How, I, I want to hear from the folks in the Discord. How are you feeling this morning? I know in the Discord, some people are still holding. I know that some people sold. I know that some people in the Discord bought Ape as cheap as below 70 cents and were able to sell yesterday at 210, 220, 230. So if any of you are wondering when we're talking about people got out of this play with money, guys, realize what we've been talking about in the Discord. And I don't give trading advice on my YouTube channel, but we talk about it extensively in the Discord about the good and the bad, the positive and negative of everything about this lawsuit and what is going to happen after the reverse split and conversion. Uh, there were people that were positioned correctly for the settlement and they made a lot of money yesterday. Some of them are still in. Some of them couldn't trade in after hours. Uh, and we're, we're kind of still talking about this now and we have another live stream I do with May Morrow kind of to think out loud what's going to happen next week. Uh, I think there's a very good chance that the prices that we're seeing in after hours Friday, for those of you that couldn't sell Friday, will likely hold near that level because of the arbitrage. Uh, so you, you could have an opportunity still to make some trading decisions on Monday if you're trying to get out of the play. And of course, if you decide to stay in it, that is, uh, that is entirely possible. Uh, another choice that you can make. No hangover, Joseph. But uh, remember, I haven't really been drinking since June when I, when I got on, when I, I got on the fat loss program. So it <laughs> doesn't take much. I think I, I probably had three healthy scotch. It was dark out there. I couldn't even see how much I was pouring. Looks like about a fourth of the bottle's gone. Uh, English guy, yes, I sold everything, as did many in our Discord. And uh, we can talk about the why, but I don't, you know, I don't know if you guys want to hear about the why. I don't, I, I don't want this to be about what I'm doing. I want it to be about sharing the information as we've always done, and you guys make up your own minds what you think is going to happen. If you have questions, I'll do my best to uh, answer them to the best of my ability. Keith says, Tony, you mentioned the fundamental play was the play. Are you saying that won't pay off debt right now? Uh, we Listen, we heard Adam Aaron say in the earnings call that uh, when someone asked him what would he do if he raised money, I did not hear him say anything about paying off debt. So that's one thing I'm paying attention to. I've also chatted with May just in DMs very briefly. I, uh, I really want to have the live stream with her tomorrow because I don't know all of her thoughts and I thought let's just do it live let me ask her some questions and so we can all learn together but the brief interchange that we had she said that she doesn't think uh, AMC is going to pay off the debt so that's two two little things that I'm thinking about and I, I talked to May I guess about two weeks ago okay. she told me that two little things that someone uh we're, we're getting some feedback from the Discord. So, so with that being said, May basically said, you know, AMC would be best served to push off their debt if they raise. And, and I, I agree with that. I've been telling you guys for a long time. Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Mediocre.
Um, mediocre, if you can hear me, go ahead. I've been telling you that AMC needs cash on the balance sheet to survive a couple more years, right? They're not profitable. So the most important thing that I... Well, I was going to say that... Um... Don't forget uh, me and Mass uh, met with uh, Adam Aaron as well, and he said uh, he wasn't going to pay down the debt. That's right. Face, so uh, there's many, also that. Many, many months ago, Mediocre and Massalorian met with Adam Aaron, asked him some questions directly, and he told them months ago that he was not planning to pay off the debt. So all these little things stack up. Uh, and so when I talk about balance sheet improvement, just realize that, Balance sheet improvement can be stacking cash on the balance sheet. It doesn't have to be paying off the debt. If you go raise $2 billion and then spend $2 billion paying off the debt, you're going to save $40 million a quarter on interest payments, but now you're out of cash again. Think about that, and you'll understand why I think that paying off the debt is not his main priority. And for me looking at AMC's balance sheet and income statement and where they're at, the main priority, I think, for them should be preserving cash. Sell some shares, get cash on the balance sheet, fix the working capital ratio, and uh, have enough cash to weather the next year, two years, and then pray to the gods, both old and new, that the movie industry recovers enough the AMC can start booking back-to-back -back profitable quarters. Alan says, was fear of dilution your main motivator of selling? Yes, if you've been listening to my live streams, we have been very clear, as clear as I can without giving you trading instructions. I've said over and over and over on the live streams, I'm not worried about a reverse split. And I, I'll say it again, like I said on all of these live streams, you should be paying attention to the risk of dilution. That's exactly how I've said it on the live streams. I'm saying it to you again. You, you're going to make up your own minds. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but that is why I got out. The company needs to raise money. It is going to be good for the company. I might buy back in if it drops after dilution. I might buy back in after that, but uh, I had traded my AMC for Ape at the last quarterly run-up when an AMC ran up to six. So I was not Ape heavy until recently, uh, but that recent run-up to six gave me an opportunity to sell my AMC. I took a little bit of a hit on that, but I was able to take that money and move it over to Ape. And then I, I got rid of that uh, last night. So still love the company, uh, but I don't want to take a risk with uh, sitting around figuring out what's gonna happen with dilution. Look, I can always buy back in. It starts moving up. That's the, the beauty of having, uh, you know, no, no one's stopping you from buying back in if something moves, right? People make it seem like, oh, once you trade out of a play, uh, you're done. Uh, if I'm a momentum trader too. Just like I've been momentum trading GameStop, I'll look for opportunities if they present themselves. But I have stepped out of the risk that I perceive of dilution. Whether or not it's going to tank the price, I have no idea. And for those of you that choose to stay in, I hope it doesn't. For me, being a mostly risk-averse person, that was the choice I made. How is it possible anything goes, says for AMC to drop 25% because of, because of the, uh, the arbitrage play? It doesn't matter how many shares were in those candles. There were no buyers in those candles. When you have massive selling pressure, the price drops. Uh, Edward says, do you think Ape will settle at $3 or lower where it's at now? Uh, we, let's pu pull up the chart. Mediocre, do you want to walk them through this since you pointed this out?
Mediocre, do you want to walk them through this since you pointed uh, these candles out? I guess. If not, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, but you guys can see the, the red candle on the left and where we're at on the right. That was uh, back from July 10th. We've heard Adam Aaron, we've heard Adam Aaron say that he thinks the price is going to convert around 30. I plugged in the current price after hours of AMC and Ape. I'm coming up with a conversion price of 26 to 27 dollars based on the floats and the current price. That obviously could change if AMC goes up next week. Uh, but my guess, if I had to guess, is they will probably be trading in this current range where they're at. What do you guys think? I know there's going to be a, a wide variety of opinions out there in YouTube land, Twitter land, and uh, everyone's, gonna, everyone's going to have their opinions, and then we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Uh, Mike says, "Did mediocre sell his position?" Yeah, I think we're at the uh, the peak of it, but I don't know. We'll see what happens Monday. I'll let I'll let mediocre speak if he wants to about what he did with his position. Jennifer says, "I didn't see this coming, but I'm down almost all my money." I know. Uh. uh there, there was a reason in the Discord that we were talking with folks about what could happen if the settlement was approved. Now, it was a risk, right? Because we didn't know it was going to be approved 100%. But uh, I, I, we kind of realized many, many months ago that the, the risk was holding AMC into uh, a conversion. And so all right, that's what we've been talking about. I, I know that's not a popular talking point. I get it. But uh, I, had, I talked to one guy this morning that said he was down $200,000 in this play. And after switching to Ape, buying it recently as low as 70 cents and then selling yesterday, Instead of getting out of this play down two hundred thousand dollars, he got one hundred and sixty thousand of that back. I mean, it's better better to be out with negative forty for him than just sit and do nothing and and exit the play two hundred thousand or be stuck two hundred thousand down for the next two years. Now he's got one hundred and sixty thousand dollars he can trade with again. Mike says, uh, I'm going to rephrase your question, Mike. What changed? Uh, the company's running low on cash, Mike, and now we're facing a dilution event. You, uh, when I hashtag, when I tweet hashtag evolve, I'm not a static trader, guys. When things change, when, the, when you're looking at the financial statements, when you're looking at documents and you see what is coming, I make choices. You can choose to keep on holding. That's your choice. All right, let's go through this document. Um, it's kind of a tough pill to swallow. I'm not a smart trader by any means, but I did what I had to. Who was that? Uh, Cheesemo? It it. Cheesemo, can you hear me? I think we're on a little bit of delay with the folks in the, the Discord. Yeah, Cheesemo. All right. Um, yeah, it is a tough pill to swallow. I mean, we all had anyone. It's that, a huge delay. Let me see if I can change the uh, 
the latency on the stream. It is a tough pill to swallow, making that choice to sell some of your ape or all of uh, your AMC or your ape at a loss. And everybody had to struggle with that. But the flip side is they, you know, you got the upside on, on ape. All right. Settlement consideration consists of additional shares of common stock awarded to current common stockholders. So if you're holding AMC right now and you hold all the way through to the date of the reverse split, you will get the settlement. Ape shares, just to be clear, you're not going to get any settlement on those. It's just AMC common shares. As Delaware law requires, parties submitted the settlement terms to the court for approval. This is my second opinion, uh, Zern says, regarding the settlement terms. The court's consideration of a proposed settlement comprises four tasks. First, they must determine whether the class should be certified under Rule 23 and if it should be certified as opt-out or non-opt-out. In this opinion, I certify the class as non-opt-out under Rule 23. So uh, we are a class, and it's a non-opt-out class. Second, the court must review the adequacy of notice of the proposed settlement, and she concludes that the notice was sufficient and its delivery was adequate. I want you to pay attention to this next part because it's something we've talked about often here. The court considers the shareholders to be people that are direct registered. All of the rest of us that are beneficial holders through a broker in the eyes of the Delaware court are not direct shareholders. This, if you DRS or if you're a broker that is registered with computer share, you are a shareholder. Everybody else, even though it makes you mad, you're not a shareholder. You're a beneficial owner. So she goes on to say here, under Delaware law, only stockholders oh, of record. Oh, there's something in this trap. Hey, Dana. Dana, we're live on uh, YouTube. Looks like Dana's out. Dana's out fishing. Sorry. Yeah, no I problem. I am fostering. <laughs> Have fun fishing. That looks beautiful. Thanks, Sarah. Um, she says under Delaware law, only stockholders of record are required to receive notice. Stockholders of record being people registered with computer share. Under Delaware law, only stockholders of record are required to receive notice. Here, comprehensive electronic notice coupled with supplemental but imperfect postcard notice was adequate under Delaware law. I get it. That's not popular with anybody that was upset about the postcard thing. That was a failure of any of them to understand Delaware law and who the law in Delaware considers a shareholder or a holder of record. Jeffrey Jones, what's up? Dr. Spurgeon, the Sturgeon Surgeon. Good morning. We'll get into, uh, come back and ask me about fair market value if, uh, if you're still here when we get through this document. We've talked about it in previous lives. I'm happy to talk about it again. Uh, th third, the court must review terms of the proposed settlement for reasonableness and determine whether to approve it. She says, I conclude the settlement is reasonable. While the plaintiff's fiduciary claim had merit, a remedy for that claim is equitable and beneficial to the class a remedy for that claim that is equitable and beneficial to the class overall is challenging to identify. The plaintiff's statutory claim had no merit. And finally, if the settlement is approved, the court must resolve the plaintiff's petition for an award of attorney's fees and expenses, and she is going to award 
plaintiff's counsel fees worth 12% of the settlement consideration, which I think, you know, the payout that AMC is going to have to pay is what, somewhere in the, the neighborhood of $120 million. So they'll get 12% of that amount. And then uh, there were some incentive rewards. If you were uh, a plaintiff in the case, you get a $5,000 payment for your time and trouble. So Allegheny is going to get $5,000, and all of the AMC shareholders will get the award, the settlement award. Barry says, if I received a postcard, does that mean I'm a legitimate shareholder? Let there's a, a shareholder of record under Delaware law is anybody that is registered with computer share. You're in, you're in the book, the ledger at computer share as a shareholder of record. That is a very small percentage of you and all of the brokers. Those are the shareholders of record. All the rest of us that trade in Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, Webull, we are beneficial owners. Yes, we are legitimate owners, but we're not shareholders of record. That just means your name is written in the ledger at ComputerShare. So if you have shares in your account in any broker, you are a legitimate holder. Whether or not your shares were borrowed and then resold to you, I can't tell you that. No one can tell you that. Maybe your broker, you know, if you, if you sued him. <laughs> Maybe the DTCC. You haven't missed much yet, DHG. We're just getting started. All right. Um, she goes on. The last thing she's talking about here is Izzo's stay pending appeal. An objector moved for a stay on uh, the status quo order pending appeal to the Supreme Court. If the settlement was approved, indicating an intention to appeal uh, the July 21st opinions holding that the release does not improperly release future claims, this opinion concludes such a stay would not be appropriate. So Zern is not going to uh, approve a stay. Uh, that doesn't mean that these folks can't now go do an appeal to the Supreme Court, but She's not going to hold this up. Zern is not going to hold this up. So now I guess it's a race, I guess. It's a race to see uh, if these people go file an appeal with the Supreme Court asking for a stay pending an appeal or how fast AMC launches the paperwork to enact a reverse split and conversion. Backyard Boogie says, do you think the split will go through on Monday? So we know that uh, NYSE has a 10-day rule that uh, companies are supposed to uh, adhere to when they submit their paperwork. NYSE manual says, you know, don't make it sooner than 10 days because we need to get all our shit straight on our end. What I don't know, and we saw that from the both attorneys, right, on their most recent motions, they mentioned that 10-day thing. Uh, I, I would, that is fact. The NYSE manual says that you need, you're supposed to, supposed to take 10 days. What I don't know, Backyard Boogie, is if AMC working with their contact there at the NYSE, which they most certainly do have, I call it a concierge, but you know, their 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 person that they work with. I don't know if they've already pre-filed the paperwork and chopped off some of those ten days. We'll have to find that out together. I I we'll we'll see. It would not surprise me if it doesn't take ten days. Let's put it that way. But it could. I don't know. <laughs> Corbin, <laughs> I try and take as many questions. Corbin, I feel like often I answer the questions over and over, same ones, but uh, I don't mind that at all. 
because a lot of times we have new people in here. Uh, she's talking about Izzo had filed a motion with a desire to become lead plaintiff. Did she answer that here? No, nah, she doesn't really talk about it. I think because uh, the July 21st opinion was not a final determination, she didn't have to rule on that. All right, let's see what she has to say about analysis. This part we can skip. Delaware law favors settlements. I've tried to communicate that to you guys. Uh, when I've been telling you the settlement was the most likely outcome, the Delaware law favors settlement, and both the plaintiff, Allegheny and AMC, were in court arguing for the settlement to be approved. So you have both parties saying, please approve this. We're going to work with you, judge, to get you something you can approve. And the court is traditionally biased towards approving settlements if the parties agree. The court just then has to consider whether the terms of the settlement are fair and reasonable. And she goes on to, uh, in her own words, say what I just said. Once a settlement happens, the litigation enters a new and unusual phase where former adversaries at Allegheny and AMC join forces to convince the court that their settlement is fair and appropriate. Once again, the court expresses gratitude to the special master and her team whose hard work was fully described in the July 21st opinion. On July 27th, stockholder Karen Grelish submitted a filing contesting the July 21st opinions, finding that her ob objection and thus her exception were non-compliant. The next day, I stated I was treating her filing as a motion for reconsideration and set a briefing schedule pursuant to Rule 59F. I thank plaintiffs for this clarification and will consider Relish's exception as compliant. The compliant exceptions touch on a range of issues. Talking about Grelish still. And she finishes up by saying, I've conducted my own de novo analysis of the issues addressed in this opinion. I've also considered each compliant exception to the special master's report de novo to the extent relevant to my decision today and my analysis follows. Class certification. I don't know that we need to read through all of this. Well, yeah, I mean, we know that she ruled the, the, that the class was certified. Let's see if there's anything interesting to pick out here. DH says, thanks for all your efforts, Tony. I've learned a lot from you and will continue to work with you. I appreciate you. Captain Caveman says, uh, dumb question, holding only ape into the conversion, the value will not change in my account with the conversion. Um, ape is, right, what, around 215, 219 right now? <clears throat> to, you know, a lot of, to answer your question, I would have to know what date the conversion is and what the exact price will be the night before. But let's just say for an example, that the conversion is on Monday morning 
and the price is exactly where they're at in after hours, then by my math, the conversion price would be 26 or $27. So if you're holding APE at 215 you and it reverse splits and converts, you'd be looking at about $26. So that's from 215 to 260. You get a little bit of a push up. I don't know that that will be the case because I don't know what date the conversion's happening, nor do I know exactly what AMC and APE are going to do. I guess and what he's asking, Tony, is... Go ahead, Mediocre. Yeah, he, he's asking if, um, if he holds all eight, if conversion hurts him. That's not the conversion... Um, <clears throat> That's going to hurt him because of the float. Yeah, I, I think you'll be okay if you're holding all ape into conversion. What we don't know is what's going to happen between now and the it's conversion dilution. date, right? And we don't and we don't know when Adam Aaron is going to announce dilution. Is it going to be right away? Is it going to be a month from now? Uh, as I've said many many times, I'm not as worried about the reverse split and the conversion for me or any of you as much as I am concerned about dilution because we know that dilution on every stock we follow tend to the majority of the time have some downward pressure on price. MC, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Uh, I got a comment overnight, someone saying, Tony's made videos <laughs> talking about how the QCIP change is going to uh, make this thing skyrocket. Never once made a video about QCIP. And I have many, many, many times told you guys. It, you, it's all in, in the comments of my videos over the last six months. And we've talked about it in the live streams. I do not believe ever that a QCIP change is a catalyst. Let's get that very clear. And you will not find any video on my channel of me saying that QCIP change is a catalyst other people have said that i that's on them guys uh robert asking is this the final judgment no this is uh, the final judgment will be coming one of these days here in the near future Nate says, uh, do I think AMC will squeeze? I, I think it's going to be tough, Nate, with the dilution. It's going to be much tougher. Short interest is 30% on AMC. It's about 8% on APE. When they combine, you're going to be looking at a new short interest around 20%. Roughly, I haven't done the math. I'm just like spitballing it. And I do not think that the shorts are going to get out of this play to answer that very bluntly. I do not think that the shorts are going to be rushing to cover during a reverse split and a conversion. They are in this play because of the, the fundamentals, because of the actor strike, because of the fact that the company doesn't have cash. What will make them a little more worried, I think, as I've communicated to you guys, is when AMC raises cash and fixes the balance sheet, now you're extending the life of the company by several years. That ruins in the short term. As long as the company has cash, that fucks up the short thesis. It makes them reconsider the timeline on their play. And I know this is we're talking buckets of time, right? What's going to happen next week versus what's going to happen two, three months from now, six months from now, when Adam says he raised $2 billion. We're talking different time frames. Different things are going to happen. Uh, Roscoe, yes, we'll be talking about other stuff. Absolutely. So uh, is 
a short squeeze play over to answer your question directly. I consider short squeeze plays anything that has over 20% short interest. You have a chance on Good News Catalyst to get some uh, short squeeze. So after the conversion, we'll have to wait a couple days for Ortex to recompile the data and see what the new short interest is. But I think it will be, it'll come in somewhere around 20%. And then, then AMC needs to fix their balance sheet and they need profitable quarters. They need to raise money to, uh, to screw shorts out of this play, to scare them out of this play. All right, all of this is talking about certifying the class. I really don't want to read all that. It's, Did the, uh, the judge shut down any of the opposition on that letter, Tony? Like a Rose Izzo or something like that? Yeah, we're going to find out. We're getting, we're getting to that. I think it's going to... Hang on one second. My wife's trying to uh, text me. One second. All right. Uh, we're still talking about certifying the class, aren't we? Yep. A lot of talk about Izzo's motion. I'm trying to get to the wrap up of, of what, uh, what Zern's thoughts were, not just a recap. We already know the recap. We've been living it. Uh, the court, this court, the Delaware Court of Chancery, she says, has repeatedly, uh, you know, one thing that Izzo was complaining about was Allegheny. <clears throat> didn't own a bunch of shares. And so, you know, maybe she should be the lead plaintiff. <clears throat> Zern says, this court has repeatedly determined that representative plaintiffs who hold small numbers of shares are capable of vigorously prosecuting a case. So she didn't really buy that argument from Izzo. <clears throat> Delaware courts routinely appoint institutional stockholders as lead plaintiffs and representative actions for good reason. The mere fact that plaintiffs traded differently than other members of the class does not make their interest in the shares they hold antagonistic to those of their fellow sh stockholders. Plaintiffs suffered the same type of harm proportionate to their common stock holdings as every other class member. Izzo has not demonstrated that plaintiffs' interests are not aligned with those of the class in remedying that harm. So, wrap up, uh, Zern dismissed Izzo's exceptions. Finally, the court is satisfied that the plaintiff's counsel are competent and qualified to prosecute this action. I th think we all have our own thoughts about that. They have... <laughs> But they are 
some of the top attorneys in that in in that region for prosecuting these type of cases. Uh, whether or not we saw that in action in the uh, in the hearing is debatable. They have ample experience in class and corporate litigation. Without any substantiated argument to the contrary, the court finds that the representative plaintiffs to be adequate class representatives. All right, let's see what y'all are saying over here. Roseanne says, it cracks me up how everyone is hating on Adam Aaron. His job is to save the company. Amen. That is his job, literally. He is in a no-win situation. Yep, we, we uh, declined giving him more cash uh, back in 2021 when he needed it, and now the company's running out of cash, and he, they took the action that they deemed necessary, as unpalatable as it was for some people. They took action to not let the company go bankrupt. They're doing the exact opposite of what people are trying to spin it as. They're trying to bankrupt the company. No, they're trying to do the exact opposite. And yes, retail traders will pay some price when dilution happens for that. But recognize what they are doing is trying to not wipe you all to zero by going bankrupt. That is the other option. Gia Mortal, uh, what is your question? Kevin says, if one owns a thousand shares of AMC common stock today, how many will you own after conversion? You'll, it'll drop to a hundred and then you got to divide that by 7.5 for your bonus, your settlement. So you'll get an extra 13 shares, you will have 113. <laughs> <We're shot. laughs> TF Hatter says, Tony called Mullen dead to rights also. I mean, there's not too many stocks that I have called incorrectly. I, I'm not very popular because I don't tell people what they want to hear, but uh, like I said, the absolute worst call that I had in the last year anyways, was not selling APE as soon as it was issued. I put too much faith in retail thinking that they would support APE and clearly they didn't. And uh, many of us that held APE paid the price on that. But fortunately, we had the opportunity to buy it in really, really cheap later. And uh, that is what I did. Papa Mac says, weren't you advocating for the settlement? Let's be clear, Papa Mac. It's, yes, I'm, I was advocating for the settlement because in my mind, the alternative of no settlement is bankruptcy. I hope that is clear. I've tried to explain this to you guys. I understand there's many, many people telling you the company is not going bankrupt. I disagree. They have bankruptcy risk sometime in the next year, especially with the actor's strike and if there aren't profitable quarters. Even with this profitable quarter we just had, the company still lost $60 million off the balance sheet. So if you're gonna ask me to pick between bankruptcy for all of us or a settlement that paves the way for dilution, well, to me, the settlement option is the smarter play. It's much better than going to zero. Neither one is a great option. But we weren't given a third option. We had two options on the table, settlement or no settlement. All right, Court of Chancery, Rule 23, affidavits. Let's see what we got here. Rule 23 requires that the lead plaintiff, by the way, we're on page 27 of 111, so trying to get through this as quickly as I can. 
Rule 23 requires the lead plaintiff to file an affidavit stating the person has not received, been promised, or offered, or will not accept any form of compensation aside from any damages. Uh, looks like Allegheny and Franchi filed their Rule 23 affidavits. I don't, I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time reading through this part. Let's see what she's talking about here. Still talking about class certification. Discretionary opt-out. If the class is certified under Rule 23B, class members have an unqualified right to opt-out. There is no corresponding mandatory opt-out right for classes certified under Rule 23B. As the special master observed in a report, numerous objectors have asked to opt out of the settlement. The report recommended the court not afford discretionary opt-out rights to the class because of the nature of this relief sought and the consideration received and the special master's report also noted that objectors have not cited any controlling law or provided any persuasive reason to permit opt-outs and of course there were exceptions and objections to that but she goes on to say more broadly an opt-out right is not feasible first the notice did not provide the notice that was sent out. Tony, read some office. comments. Read some comments. Okay. Tell me, who should I read? What are we looking for, Mediocre? Melendez. Melendez. William. Who gets the settlement shares and is that a form of dilution? Good question. AMC common shareholders right now, if you're holding the day before conversion, AMC shareholders will get the settlement, not APE shareholders. Is it a form of dilution? Yes. It's gonna increase the float. All right, she says the notice that was sent out did not provide for opt-out procedure, nor was it required to do so. And an opt-out class would require another notice with a higher distribution rate before class members could, op could opt out. Second, for an opt-out right to be meaningful, class members who wanted to opt out would have to accurately follow the procedures. And procedural compliance has been a challenge in this case. Yeah, like all the, all the, well, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dunk on anybody. And third, permitting an opt out right would further delay the effective date, which, as this opinion explains, would be detrimental to AMC and the class interests. So she declines to certify a discretionary opt out class. Adequacy of notice. All right, here we get into the postcard thing again. Is the conversion on Monday, Pelosi's Baloney's wants to know. We don't know when the conversion date is yet. There should be some press release or 8K, uh, and we also need the final, I think we need the final judgment from the judge, right? This is her opinion. We still need her to enter the final judgment. That's the gavel on her desk so be looking for the final judgment to hit the docket and be watching for a press release or an 8k from amc telling you what the reverse split date will be that's when the conversion will happen all right postcard <clears throat> Rule 23 requires that notice of proposed settlement be given to stockholders 
The court evaluates both the contents of the notice and its delivery. The notice's contents were sufficient. An adequate notice puts stockholders on notice as to the general nature of the subject matter and warns them that their substantial interests are involved. That's it in a nutshell. Puts stockholders on notice as to the general nature of the subject matter and warns them that their substantial interests are involved. Now, a lot of people appended their own meaning to the postcard notice that uh, it was required to file an objection. That is not the point of the notice. The point of the notice is to let you know that there is a case pending on your stock and that your substantial interests are involved. A notice of settlement is sufficient if it contains a description of the lawsuit, the consideration for the settlement, the location and time of the hearing, and informs class members that additional information can be obtained by contacting class counsel. Together, the stipulation and the notice describe the underlying facts related to the litigation, the claims the plaintiffs pled, and the procedural history of the action and the proposed settlement. The notice provides the location and time of the settlement hearing. Finally, the notice informs stockholders who to contact for further information. Therefore, she concludes the contents of the notice are adequate. Now, the most contested part, was it adequately distributed? She starts off by saying it was adequately distributed. Notice is to be delivered in such a manner as the court directs, by mail, publication, or otherwise. Notice is adequately delivered if it is sent to record holders, again, She's going to keep hammering home what Delaware law says, not what everybody on Twitter or Al from Boston says. A record holder is people that are registered with computer share. DRS holders and the brokers are the record What's holders. What's up, peeps? Hey, Rolf, uh, this chat is uh, live on YouTube, FYI, or whoever that was that popped in. Okay, crazy. That was Richie. Richie, what's up, brother? It's Ralph, Richie. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, you're, you guys are welcome to chime in. Um, I mean, you're here in the voice, so you can share thoughts anytime. Don't, but uh, just just be aware that you're live. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so record holders, guys, are people that are in the ledger at ComputerShare. All the rest of us. That are holding and brokers we are not record holders delaware law does not ca care about us we are beneficial holders under well settled delaware law non-record holders the rest of us assume the risk that they may not receive notice from their custodian or their nominee under well settled delaware law beneficial holders all of us if you're not DRS, assume the risk that they may not receive notice. So that all of these complaints that were sent to the judge about I didn't get my postcard, to be blunt, it doesn't matter under Delaware law. There is no requirement to mail a settlement notice to every single class member who ever owned a share of a publicly held company. This is the judge's words. The scheduling order required AMC to deliver the best notice practicable under these circumstances. Here, notice was adequate under the unique circumstances of the case. AMC has millions of human beneficial stockholders, those of us that hold it in a broker, all over the world. AMC's retail base has a reputation for their online activity but many of AMC's human stockholders, as opposed, I guess, to institutions, presumably do not monitor their AMC investment online, and the parties sought notice on a compressed timeline designed to permit AMC access to vital capital if the settlement was approved. The company distributed notice electronically and by publication 
on the website, on the Twitter account via an 8K over PR Newswire, and on the DTC's legal notice system. In most instances for publicly traded companies with a higher percentage of institutional stockholders, that is enough. However, in addition, in this high profile case, these electronic disclosures were amplified in the press and on social media by all of us talking about it. What the company sent out was amplified a million times over by people talking about it on social media, in the news, on Twitter, in YouTube, etc. To reach human stockholders who may not be monitoring their investment or financial or legal news online, the court also directed the company to promptly cause postcard notices to be mailed, even though, as she said earlier, that is not a requirement under Delaware law. At AMC's direction, notice administrator Strategic Claim Services mailed, and I know there's been a lot of squawking on Twitter, who hired Strategic Claim Services? It was never a secret if you know how to read. AMC hired Strategic Claim Services, and at their direction, this independent company mailed postcards to the 16,382 record holders, people on the ledger at ComputerShare. DRS individuals and stock brokers, 16,382, got their postcard first. On May 1st, those were sent out. Uh, the mailing of the postcard to those record holders was completed by May 8th. Then as the brokers got off their ass and decided to give SCS, Strategic Claim Services, our names and addresses, and many of these damn brokers took weeks, but the court doesn't have authority over the brokers. As they provided names and addresses to SCS, another 2.8 million postcard notices were sent out. According to the judge, this is a majority of the 3.8 million. You can see by her words here, she has no, it was not a requirement in her eyes for every single shareholder to receive a postcard. Postcard notice was far from perfect. The notice administrator failed to mail or facilitate mailing of notice to approximately a million beneficial owners. One broker, I think it was Robinhood, was significantly delayed in mailing postcards to another 1.5 million beneficial holders. The postcard sent recipients to a non-functioning URL that did not direct to the correct website, which I think they fixed at some point. But future settling parties should not use this case as a model for distributing postcard notice. Uh, amen, brother. Amen, brother Zern. Still on the unique facts of this case, I conclude the notice was adequate. Electronic notice was comprehensive. The postcards were intended to provide supplemental notice to retail who might have missed the comprehensive electric, electronic notice. Record holders, those on the ledger at ComputerShare, received their postcards on time. Beneficial owners, all the rest of us, are not entitled to actual notice. I know that makes y'all upset that you've been lied to by people on Twitter and Al from Boston and all these yahoos telling you that you had to receive your postcard. You did not under Delaware law. That is going to make you mad. I understand that. Don't be mad at the judge. Don't be mad at me. Be mad at the people who misinformed you what was required under Delaware law. That's bottom line. Zern says the notice afforded due process, the stockholder communications to plaintiff's counsel in the court unprecedented in their scale were variations on a the set notice. of themes. Special master and I, Judge Zern says, have considered those themes and at the risk of minimizing the concern, ingenuity, and savvy of those 
who did not t receive timely actual notice and who would have otherwise objected, the scale of the stockholder response makes it unlikely that additional actual postcard notices would have presented a uh, dispositive, I think that's how you pronounce that word, issue with the proposed settlement that was not already identified by the court. And I kind of offhandingly remarked that many, many months ago, like, okay, I get it, not all of you got your postcards, but you were well represented by the objectors, all these objectors that sent in their objections. What, if you didn't get your postcard, what else meaningful could you have said that thousands of objectors and Rose Izzo and her attorney did not say? One more stack, one more letter on top of thousands is not going to meaningful, meaningfully tip the scale or provide any additional information to the court that wasn't already well objected by thousands of your counterparts. Uh, she says the settlement is reasonable. I will now turn to consider whether the terms of the proposed settlement are reasonable, recognizing that this court generally favors settlement of complicated litigation. Another reason why I've been telling you guys for a long time that it was most likely outcome and be prepared for it. Don't get caught flat footed. The most likely outcome was that the settlement would happen. This court, the Delaware Chancery Court favors settlement. Court's role is to act as a fiduciary, fiduciary applying a range of reasonableness review that is one step removed from the litigant's business judgment to accept the settlement. So that was what she was attempting to do. The, rule, the role of judicial review is not to second guess or optimize every element of the settlement. Rather, the court's role as a fiduciary is to ensure due process is afforded and to weigh the give against the get. In doing so, the court's function is to consider the nature of the claim, the possible defenses thereto, the legal and factual circumstances of the case, and to apply its own business judgment in deciding whether the settlement is reasonable in light of those factors. Court need not limit itself to an exam examination of the immediate tangible results to the class, a corporation, or its shareholders in determining the fairness of a settlement agreement. The court need not limit itself to an examination of the immediate tangible results to the class or its shareholders in determining the fairness of a settlement agreement. The probable long-term benefits of the settlement are, are also properly considered. All right, we already know what the settlement is, so we don't need to read this. The give and the get, I think we've beat that to death. Let's see what she says here. In the operative pl complaint, plaintiffs allege defendants breached their fiduciary duties. What does she have to say about that? Plaintiffs brought two claims, one for breach of fiduciary duty and one for violation of Section 242B. That was the whole was ape legal thing, uh, was allowing Antara to vote legal, the mirrored voting. The parties, uh, Allegheny and AMC, agree that the statutory claim was weak, the 242B. as we said here for many, many months. There was no illegality. Was it slimy? Did they do an end run around us to get their way and make sure that they don't go bankrupt? Yes, did they do it in a legal way? Yeah, even the parties 
agree that the statutory claim was weak, the 242B. They dispute the merits, though, the breach of fiduciary duty claim, but agree the court was unlikely to issue a preliminary injunction. Let's see what else she has to say here about the 242B. And before I get into that more, I want to uh, read some comments over here. Now, now, y'all says, Adam Aaron told Trey's Trades he would never consider dilutions, and now look what he's doing. Like, guys, he said that in 2021 when they had, had they, they had raised, had they raised the $2 billion when he did that interview with Trey? I forget the exact timeline now. But uh, regardless, in 2021, when you got $2 billion on the balance sheet, and in August of 2023, when you're faced with the actor's strike, pushing projects out, and a, even a profitable quarter sucking 60 million off the balance sheet and you're down to your last 400 million in cash, you're two bad quarters from being bankrupt. Remember, I mean, in a bad quarter, this company loses 200 to 225 million. We're, we're two bad quarters from bankruptcy. Now, hopefully the quarters going forward aren't as bad as what we've endured for the last two years. But Adam had to evolve. They've always known that they needed to raise more money. We, we ran out of rope before we got profitable. Uh, Spock here says, what are the chances of anything changing between this opinion and the final opinion, the final judgment? I'm not an attorney, Spock, but if you're asking me to guess, I would say slim to none. I know everybody's going to make videos, you know, keeping you on the hook with their hopium. Just wait, guys. The, the final judgment isn't in yet. Uh, I'm not going to do that to you here. I think that you'll see the final judgment here in the next, I don't know, few days, week, 10 days, it's coming. Very slim to none chance that anything is gonna change. Anya says, do you think an investor should take profits or let it ride? I don't give trading advice, Anya. I try and help you guys interpret what is happening and what is likely to happen so that you make your own choices. All right, back to 242B. Parties agree plaintiff's claim under 242B were meritless. That was the whole Allegheny, uh, sorry, Antara ape mirrored voting thing. The parties agree plaintiff's claim was meritless. What does Zern say about it? I really want to see what she says. This claim would not have succeeded under current Delaware law. In a seminal case, colloquially referred to as Dickey Clay, the Delaware Supreme Court held that where the corporate amendment does no more than to increase the number of shares of a preferred or superior class, the relative position of subordinated shares is only changed in the sense that they are subjected to a greater burden. Yada, yada, yada. Tell us your thoughts, Zern. The court recently applied Dickey Clay's holdings in SNAP. Inc. That was that uh, case that that got. Uh, I think it got decided right before it, it got appealed, and a, a decision came on that appeal right before Allegheny decided to give up. Even if the defendants effectuate the proposals, the pro proposals do not adversely affect the common stockholders' rights. Jeffrey Jones says, uh, can AMC do the conversion before the final judgment? I, I don't know 100%, Jeffrey, but I would, I would guess, I would guess not. 
What do you guys think? I, I know that the status quo order has to be lifted, and I don't think the status quo order will be lifted until the final judgment is entered. That will uh, dismiss the case and lift the status quo. That is my current understanding. If there's any attorneys on here who wish to correct me or reaffirm what I'm saying, have at it in the comments. Uh, she says that uh, common stockholders' rights were not affected by AMC's proposals that the shares of AMC common stock had and will continue to have one vote per share. Dilution of that vote is not a harm cogn cognizable. <laughs> cogniz God damn it, can't talk this morning. Dilution of that vote is not a harm cognizable. <laughs> under section 242b2 never know that i took honors english can't even read this morning plaintiffs would not have been able to demonstrate a reasonable probability of success at the preliminary injunction stage or achieve actual success on the merits releasing this claim has little value all right so 242b antara mirrored voting all that yapping about it was illegal the judge says it was not illegal very clearly right there on page 52 i know people will still disagree with that you have your right to do that i'm done arguing it all right breach of fiduciary duty the parties dispute the merits and therefore the value of plaintiff's breach of fiduciary claim the dispute centers on the Applicable standard of review. Delaware law provides three tiers of reviewing. I don't want to walk through all of these three damn tiers. Is she going to go through all of these here? Just tell us what you thought, Zern. Under my reading of the Blasi of Blasius and the law that followed, uh, I'm assuming, including Coster, thank you, the business judgment rule would not have applied to plaintiff's breach of fiduciary duty claim. That is a big one that they've been arguing on Twitter. Zern says it would not have applied. She says, I conclude plaintiffs established the director defendants, that's the executives of AMC, acted with disenfranchising purpose in issuing the apes, entering into the deposit agreement, and entering into the Antara transaction. In this settlement context, the limited record does not convince me that those actions were reasonable. Plaintiff's claim has value. But the defendants may have been able to prevail, if not on the merits, then on the equities of a preliminary injunction by demonstrating the proposals and conversion were necessary to save AMC from imminent bankruptcy. The value of the plaintiff's claim is therefore discounted. So yeah, the courts uh, often will look at something that might appear to us to be slimy and say, okay, but did they have a compelling business need to do it? And, uh, and she's saying it looks like they did. Jeffrey Jones, thank you. He says, YouTubers say AMC isn't going bankrupt because of Barbenheimer. One movie does not make your year, my friend. That's that. This is where their analysis is flawed. Now, it's going to make Q3 way better than I thought. Remember, I was predicting Q3 was going to be abysmal. Uh, 
short of $2 billion. And we're, where are we at right now? We're, we're going to potentially break even or maybe do a, a penny profit. It depends. You know, we'll see how the rest of this month and next month go. But one movie does not make your year. And anybody who's telling you that that's like uh, an air conditioning guy say, saying that, uh, you know, I'm not going to lose money in December. You're going to lose money in December. You're going to make money when there's good movies, but you're going to lose money in slow quarters. So really the assessment is, are there enough movies for the rest of this year to get more per quarter in box office revenue than we did in Q2? Do you think that every quarter for the next two, three, four quarters is going to be as good as Q2 was? And even if you think that, do you recognize that the company still lost 60 to $65 million off the balance sheet, right? People focus on that one penny. We were profitable. You were profitable on earnings, but you lost cash. Nobody will talk to you about that because they don't want to tell you the inconvenient. They want you to focus on the shiny penny. And I, by they, I mean the YouTubers, the clickbaiters. They won't pull up a balance sheet. They won't pull up a cash flow statement. They won't show you that shit because they want to trick you that the company is not at risk of bankruptcy. They want to lie to you that the company did not lose cash. Ask them to pull up the balance sheet. Ask them to pull up a cash flow statement and walk you through it. I'm tired of doing it. I've done it. Add freaking nauseum here. Hold them accountable. Explain that. When they say this company has no bankruptcy risk, ask them to pull up all of the financial statements and walk you through them. They won't do it because they can't. And if they did, they know they would be exposed with their bullshit. All right, moving on. She's going over a bunch of previous case law, wrap, you know, winding up to her decision here. Blasius, Blasius, Blasius. Coster. So much background, very thorough lady. I'll put a link to this in the video description. If you don't like that I'm skipping over stuff, you can go read it. I don't really care to go read all of this background. I just want to see what was her summary. We're on page 71 of, of 111. All right, here we get to her, some of her wrap up. In this case, so far as I can see, a Blasius conflict is the only conflict warranting enhanced scrutiny of the plaintiff's claims and the only basis for relief. The stockholder voting rights at stake were not in a contest for control. So Unical scrutiny is not warranted. Uh, these are other cases. If you've been following Ethan or any of those guys, hopefully, or uh, Noisy Corax, hopefully you're up to speed on those. Um, 
Plaintiffs have not pled self-interest, bad faith, or negligence. The court's other tools for reviewing or enjoying direct, enjoining director action here are in a positive. Uh, the court's other tools for reviewing or enjoining director action are in a posit here. As explained, there is no viable Section 242B claim. Schnell is also a poor fit. As in Coster, the evidence does not support a finding of bad faith. The board's justification was to, ad to advance the best interest of AMC and save it from financial peril. Kind of like what I was talking about just a couple minutes ago. What, even though it was slimy, in the board's opinion, the stewards of the company, were they making a business judgment to save the company from financial peril. That's what the judge is looking at here. Plaintiffs make rumblings about the adequacy of the disclosure of the deposit agreement and the truthfulness of the statements accompanying the APE issuance that no conversion was intended. Yeah, Adam did, did, did tell us, you know, we weren't going to convert for a long time. But those disclosure issues are thin reeds to hold the weight of the injunction sought here, and the defendant's actions were non-ministerial. They comprised much more than scheduling a meeting, moving a record date, or retaining a proxy solicitor. Having concluded Blasius review is available, I proceed to evaluate plaintiff's call for enhanced scrutiny. Whew, she's just, all right, we're not going to read all of this. Let's take a break for a second, answer some questions. Let's see what Dan and Blazin are chatting about here. What's up, Blazin? Broke Ape, how you doing? Dan says, I asked several times in the past months how a reverse split merger would magically make the company pay off debt. Uh, that does not do anything. Reverse split conversion does not do anything, right? Uh, dilution that follows allows the company to raise cash. You got to do the reverse split to create this room, these free shares, available shares. You got this many shares. When you reverse split, the outstanding shares drops to a fraction of that. Now all these shares that were authorized are now available to be reissued. And uh, so the company will issue a prospectus. You guys have seen this play out in a hundred other stocks, right? You should know how this works by now, but I'll finish the example. After the reverse split, they issue a prospectus. They sell new shares. It's called dilution. They raise money. And then what the company does with that money, all, every damn company we watch that goes through this, what they do with that money is up to them. They could pay Nicole Kidman. They could buy a gold mine. They could upgrade their facilities. They could pay off debt. They could buy another company, uh, a competitor. They could buy other assets, other theaters. The main thing is right now, if you look at the balance sheet, we are negative $800 million when you look at current assets to current liabilities. AMC is negative $800 million in its ability to pay its bills that are due in the next 12 months. It is imperative that they get cash on the balance sheet or they are screwed. I don't care what anybody tells you that says the company doesn't have a bankruptcy risk. Ask them to explain you in their own words, the working capital situation. This company is negative $800 million in its ability to pay its bills. In the next 12 months, <clears throat> they have to raise cash. Now, if they have an opportunity to take some of that cash and pay off debt, negotiate a discount on some of that debt. Will they do it? Yes, they probably will. Do I expect that they're going to pay off all the debt? I do not because Adam didn't talk about that in his most recent call right now. And on top of that, on top of what he didn't say in the most recent earnings call, it is more important for them to have cash to survive than to pay off $5 billion in debt. They can refinance that debt once they fix the balance sheet with cash. 
They can renegotiate it, get better interest rates, potentially pay off some of it with a discount, push it out five more years. There's, they have a lot of flexibility once they get a cash raise in. Uh, Herman says, is Adam waiting for rates to go down before paying off the debt? Um, you know, what he could do, Herman, that's a good point. He could, <clears throat> he could strike a new deal with the lenders, push the debt out, even if he doesn't get better rates right now. But the, the fact of pushing the debt out and raising cash at the same time vastly improves the company's uh, financial picture, right? If he can do dilution, even though that sucks for retail, get cash on the balance sheet, renegotiate the debt, push it out, the whole picture changes. And then in the future, if rates come down, he could conceivably get better rates. He could also, by doing a cash raise and pushing some of the debt out, improve the company's credit rating and, and potentially get better financing than what they have now. Uh, I want to hear more from May tomorrow on that. So if you got questions about the debt, way more her area of expertise than me. And uh, Markets with May and I will be having a live stream tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. And I really want to dig into this topic. So for those of you that are interested in hearing more about that, we're gonna pick her brain. So get your questions ready. All right, <clears throat> she's going through here on these pages all the uh, all the history of AMC trying to raise money, then coming up with the idea of Ape. Plaintiffs, she says, plaintiffs would likely have been able to establish that AMC created Ape with the purpose of rendering the common stockholders' votes irrelevant uh, via the, uh, the mirrored voting structure. Defendants AMC sought to overcome stockholders' right to vote no and their right not to vote, their rational apathy the board's actions were similar in intent and effect to those in Peerless, another case. It manipulated the corporate machinery to rig the special meeting vote to overcome common stockholder opposition and the defeating presence of non-votes. The creation and issue of the APE units together with the deposit agreement and the Antara transaction dictated the outcome of stockholder votes on the proposals. The defendants purposely diluted the common stockholders' votes to the point of meaninglessness. And we saw in the judge's uh, July opinion, if I'm not mistaken, that she was uh, hammering these same ho points home, that uh, what AMC did was a little bit slimy in rigging the vote. Uh, but I think people back in July read her recapping something when she's recapping something, she's not giving you an opinion on it yet. She's telling you the facts. <laughs> Let's see what her actual opinion is. Hopefully she gets to the point here in a second. Plaintiffs would likely establish the defendants acted with the primary purpose of thwarting the common stockholder franchise. So this leaves the question of whether the defendants could show that their actions were reasonable in relation to their legitimate objective, saving the company from financial ruin. The defendants assert that they did what they did in 2022 because AMC was in dire financial straits. After the pandemic, despite the contributions of retail investors, AMC's net loss in 2022 was just shy of $1 billion. 
It was burdened with approximately 5.1 billion of costly debt and had to negotiate extensions of the suspension period for various financial payments. Uh, uh, you guys realize that, right? The, all the lenders have given AMC some covenant extensions instead of forcing bankruptcy. AMC is, what's the right word to say here? They're in violation of the debt covenants. That means if the lenders don't give them a waiver, they could foreclose or call that debt due. That is our current situation, right? I don't know if all of y'all are aware of that. That's been the situation for over two years. We keep on giving the, these covenant waivers and extension on, the, on, those, on those from the lenders, thank God, or this company would have been bankrupt already. AMC is in violation of various financial payments. Unless revenue and attendance levels rose, the failure to obtain additional liquidity through equity capital would likely result in bankruptcy. AMC was left without any other way to raise equity capital other than APE, as she's summarizing here. At least at this stage of the proceedings, the defendants have shown AMC was losing money and needed to raise cash in 2022 but not that bankruptcy was imminent. Indeed, AMC is still a going concern. Perhaps in April 2023, uh, at the preliminary injunction stage, the defendants would have been able to show that in 2022, AMC was in desperate need of cash, could only raise it through equity capital and needed to do so promptly, lest they declare bankruptcy and all AMC investors lose their investment. The defendants may have been able to show their actions were reasonable in relation to the legitimate objective, Plaintiff's breach of fiduciary duty claim has merit and therefore value. So she did find merit in the plaintiff's breach of fiduciary duty claim. All right, pause for a second, read some comments. Uh, Urban Ape says, am I buy buying back in on Monday? Uh, I will continue to evaluate it as a momentum trade. If it's moving up uh, any at any time, of course, like any play, I will consider getting back in. Other than that, as I stated at the beginning of this call, I will be waiting to see what happens with dilution. What's the size of it? What's the timing? And uh, that's where I'm at in my thoughts right now. Dan says, no one knows the conversion price. Yeah, we don't know the conversion price because we don't know what the price of the two tickers will be the night before the conversion. But if it was based on Friday extended hours close, by my math, it would convert at $26 to $27 in that range. <laughs> Bill A says, why not just renegotiate the debt forever? I know, right? I bet, I mean, AMC made $8 million net profit in Q2. You do the math. How, if you're making $8 million bucks or $10 million, or as I was going over with one of our CPA friends a couple days ago, even if AMC was making $100 million profit every quarter, how long is it going to take to pay back $5 billion just off of profits? They could have that debt for a long ass time. Depending, you know, what they do with cash raise, if they attack any of the debt with that, I don't know. All right, we're on page 80. Uh, when do I think the theaters will start to feel the impact of the writer's strike? Uh, the last actor's strike, I think, was in 20, 2000, 2000, if I'm not mistaken. And that one lasted six months. So if this one lasts six months, I would be, I'd, I'd have very elevated concern myself. If it's over by the end of this month, I think we can scrape by with minimal impact. It's that unknown hanging out there. How long are they going to be on strike? This AI thing, uh, the actors seem pretty serious about getting 
some concessions on that, and rightly so. Prometheus uh, says, we were, all, we were originally all here to make money. After all this time, people seem to be investing with emotions rather than rational reasons and cognitive thinking. Could not say it better myself, Prometheus. You guys are not going to badger me into feeling bad about making a trading decision because you all should be here to make money. Otherwise, why are you investing? You want to go, you know, to an emotional channel that makes you feel good. This is not the place. I'm, I'm here to make money and help you guys figure out either how to make money or in the case of what we knew was coming with this settlement, how to get on the right side of the damn trade. We know that when the conversion happens, your AMC shares are going to get spanked. And the ape was going to go up. You could still be, you could have made a decision to get ahead of that months ago, like many people did, and switch your shares. Now, if you want to be a part of a movement and you don't care what happens to your stock or your money, I, amen. I, I honor you for that. But I, there's only so much money I can lose before I have to take some definitive action to stop the bleeding and uh, that pretty much everybody that is a regular viewer of this channel or in my discord or other discords are not interested in losing more money going into a conversion and faced with the potential of an unknown dilution amount Brandy says, do I feel badgered? I, I see people trying to badger me. Nobody, nobody badgers me. All right. Uh, Jennifer, where's Jennifer? Blazin says, I can't speak for Tony, but I do think it was irrational for me. I'm assuming, Blazin, you're talking about holding. It took me longer than I'm, than I'm proud of to move on. I was wrong, but I didn't stay wrong. Blazin, are you out of the trade now? I didn't talk to you yesterday. Benedict, what's up? He says, I appreciate your honesty and, integri and integrity. I got in AMC in January 2021, got out in that summer for a great profit, you know, looking back, many of us, including myself, wish I, I wish I would have been selling at 38 instead of buying at 38 all the way in the end of 2021. But I, uh, I still thought we had a chance for a second run and that didn't happen. So hashtag evolve, right? Just like any other play that I'm in, at some point when it's not going your way, you got to Make, make some choices. Some of you won't agree with my choices. That's fine. Blazin says he's not 100% out, but he likely will be soon. Jennifer says, I have listened to these streams and didn't see this coming. Um, I'm assuming, Jennifer, you mean other people's streams I'm assuming because we've we've shown here the spreadsheet showing what's going to happen post conversion many many times now I've, I know not all of you watch every live stream but the the thesis of this channel and explaining to you guys exactly what is going to happen is why every other YouTuber hates me because I told you this was going to happen and they don't want that to be true. So I don't think it's any secret what we told you guys was gonna happen. And it's exactly what happened. So if, if you were paying attention here, you knew exactly what was gonna happen and you knew exactly how the conversion is gonna happen AMC will go down 
by about 30% and ape will go up and they will meet and convert. We've been over this many, 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 many times. Again, it is why everybody hates me for telling you that AMC was going to drop. But I say that because I didn't want you to lose that money. Only so much I can do. What else we got here, Judd Zern? The defendants have consistently held the position that the proposals and the conversions were designed to and must be effectuated promptly to raise essential cash. Yeah, that AMC saying, we, we need it right away, Your Honor. As explained above, they provided evidence that in 2022, they had to earn revenue or sell equity to raise cash. Once this litigation began, the AMC did not oppose plaintiff's motion to expedite and initially advocated for a hearing on any preliminary injunction motion before the vote was scheduled. At, their t at that time, their concerns were expressed in terms of market uncertainty. When they negotiated, negotiated a settlement term sheet in early March, uh, the defendant supported the settlement being conditioned on lifting the status quo order which she smacked. Zern said no to that. Defendants maintained this position through July, expressing that delays in effectuating the reverse split and the conversion could lead to dilutive equity financing or bankruptcy. Had the defendants shown that in April, preliminary injunction would put AMC into bankruptcy, the harm to the non-movement would have been a very high hurdle for plaintiffs to clear. Perhaps the defendants would have been able to make that showing. I conclude a preliminary injunction has a discounted value in the plaintiff's give. The settlement's get. Okay, so she talked about the give, now the get. If the settlement is approved, the existing common AMC shareholders, shareholders will own a slightly bigger slice of the AMC pie at the expense of the APE unit holders. This uh, ameliorates some of the dilution of the APE issuance inflicted on common stockholders. We already know all this. All right, here she's talking about the recent 10Q, the one from the quarter that just got filed. The long-term benefits of the proposed settlement to the class may be significant if, as the parties seem to agree, the proposal and the conversion are presently key to AMC's survival, even despite recent gains in revenue. AMC's second quarter 10Q, filed on August 8, 2023, reported that the company experienced an over- $225 million net loss from operating activities for the six months ending June 30th, 2023. How many YouTubers do you see making videos about that? Let's just pause for a second. Let me know if you've seen any YouTubers talking about the $225 million net loss over the last six months. Give me one second. I'll, I'll, I'll read your comments here in a second when I come back. How many of you heard from your favorite YouTubers about that?
All right. That same Form 10-Q disclosed that AMC has about $708 million in current assets. That's uh, footnote 303. All right, we can pull that up in a second. That uh, these facts may underpin the 10 Q's disclosure that the company's current cash burn rates are not sustainable long term. These facts may underpin that the company's current cash burn rates are not sustainable long term. Again, not a popular message, but you guys need to hear it because the other channels are not talking finance stuff to you. They're just saying, in my opinion, they're not going bankrupt. Well, read the damn financial statements. Stop sharing your opinion. Open up a income statement and a balance sheet and walk these good folks through it like we do here. I don't want to hear your damn opinion because your opinion is incorrect. And in AMC's words, its current assets are dwarfed by its 11.4 billion in total liabilities. Again, if you're wondering about this, what, why do we say 5 billion in debt, 11 billion in liabilities? The, the leases that the company signed for the duration of that lease, those are lease liabilities. Those get counted on the balance sheet as a total liability. I don't consider them debt in the strict definition of the word debt. It is a liability, but debt is the money the company borrowed. Debt plus lease liabilities is the total liabilities, which is $11 billion. It's like saying if you buy a house and you take out a $400,000 mortgage, you have a liability of $400,000. So, uh, and, and that would show up if you did your own personal balance sheet. You'd have equity in your house and you'd have a liability for the mortgage that you owe. So it's fair that they show up there, but it's not debt. The debt is just under $5 billion. While the company stated it believes it has sufficient cash and cash equivalents to fund its operations through the next 12 months, it is unclear how long it can do so because the company's cash burn rate is uncertain due to limited ability to predict studio film release dates, the over overall production and theatrical release levels, and success of individual titles. Now, we all want to be optimistic, myself included, and hope that we have more unexpected blockbusters like Barbie, but a company is not going to plan on the unexpected. The, they're not going to plan on hope like we do often as retail traders. They're going to plan for the worst case. Against this backdrop, the defendants anticipate the company will have to raise additional capital through equity sales to stave off bankruptcy and re remain in compliance with its loan covenants. If AMC cannot raise enough cash to pay its debt and enters bankruptcy, class members will lose their investment. Again, someone asked earlier, Tony, why were you for the settlement if it means we're going to get diluted? Because this was your other option, guys. Lose everything in a bankruptcy. Maybe not next month, maybe not next quarter, but if you hold, 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 and the company never raises money, that is the one of the likely outcomes. Unless, uh, you know, Hollywood starts cranking out billion-dollar movies twice a quarter. The proposed settlement gives the class more equity, you guys, in a struggling company and gives the company a way to raise needed revenue. In exchange for this increased slice of ownership in AMC, common stockholders would release all claims in or relating to the allegations in the Allegheny complaint or the operative complaint. All right, let's look at comments here for a sec.
Uh, Jennifer says, what was the exact thing that prompted you to sell? Um, I, I don't know for sure, Jennifer, that I got the top, right? It could, Ape could run up next week a little bit more. AMC could run up. But when we look at the chart, look back here in July, it topped out. This is Ape, 238. Look where we went Friday. Look, look at the chart. Now, the other last time we really had a run up was uh, that excitement when in February, when people, you know, first found out that Ape was going to be converted. But other than that, I'm just looking at this chart and I'm like asking myself, how likely do I think it is? What's the probability that we're going to far exceed this? I certainly, I had. I had standing good till cancel orders in up to $4 waiting for the judge's decision. But they obviously that didn't happen on Friday. So I had to cancel all those orders and reevaluate my plan in real time on Friday. I was hoping for everyone, you know, especially if you had some ape that you had bought at 60 cents or a buck that we could have a, you know, a quick little rocket up. As I've been telling the folks in my Discord uh, for many, many weeks, it might only last five minutes, but that we might have a rocket up to three or four bucks. That did not happen on Friday. And then it started coming down. So I sold, uh, not all at once, I was selling in brackets from 215 to 235. And then I sold the last little bit when it started coming back down. I, I was hanging on to those things, willing it to go over three bucks, over four bucks, but it didn't happen. And so as it started coming back down, I got, I got rid of the rest of it. All right. Um, so yes, anything can happen next week. I don't say that to inject you with hopium. I'm just saying that, you know, ju just because I did something doesn't mean you have to do it. I don't provide trading instructions. I don't even like talking about my trading in this play because no one wants to fucking hear it. But the only reason I'm answering the question is because you asked it. I'm not going to ever make a video like I'm out of ape. I'm out of AMC. If you're here right now, you get the information. Uh, I want everybody to be successful. I don't want uh, anything that I do to be a statement on the play. You're here to hear my opinions, my thoughts, what I'm doing with my trading. You ask the question, I answer it. I always told you that I would be honest with you. But uh, no, I'm, I'm not gonna turn into a Matt Kors or a review dork shitting on Adam Aaron. I, I think he's doing a great job to not let the company go bankrupt, but there are some unfortunate decisions that we're all faced with as the company runs low on cash and uh, the company has to contemplate doing a, a equity raise. <laughs> it's your money says the best thing about this live is almost over. We are almost done guys. We are almost done page 90. And, uh, one of the guys was telling me that, uh, that there's some good stuff in the, in the nineties pages. So let's see if we can get through this. Plaintiff's lead counsel is granted fees and expenses. I think she gave them 12%. Plaintiff's counsel had asked for a 20 million fee, which could be between 15 and 27%, depending on the value of the benefit. Yeah, 
yada yada yada. I don't care how you, I don't care how she calculated it. Just want to hear the wrap up. Oh, here's a little dirt, maybe. As explained, the standing and skill of counsel is a secondary factor in establishing the, the payment. Plaintiff's counsel are well known to the court, but in considering plaintiff's counsel's effort and standing, I find it necessary to consider what they have described as missteps. Law firms establish a track record over time, and they build and sometimes burn reputational capital. From my perspective, potential missteps include but are not limited to failing to abide by the court's practice of prompt responses to motions and expedited litigation, putting the court in the burdensome position of having to urge responses, which we saw Zern having to do, noncompliance with specific instructions, making representations to the court and the class, and antagonism towards absent putative class members. While I will not discuss them all here, I will focus on a few. First, it appears plaintiff's counsel failed to disclose a 2021 order from a California judge that required BB, BLBG to notify the courts of his decision regarding their failure to disclose a potential conflict. Plaintiff's counsel did not notify this court of that decision when it sought appointment as lead counsel or in the plaintiff's opening brief. I did not know about that. And while the plaintiff's counsel, this is Allegheny, while plaintiff's counsel did not, while plaintiff's counsel did discuss the related chancery case in their reply brief, <laughs> in their reply brief in support of the settlement, plaintiff's counsel failed to disclose the federal court's order or address that Izzo raised it in her objection. The lack of candor to the court is unacceptable. Bam. Plaintiff's counsel also misrepresented in the plaintiff's opening brief in support of the proposed settlement that one of their cli clients at the time signed a Rule 23 affidavit in support of the proposed settlement, and he had not. Yeah, wh who was that? That was the guy that ended up dropping out of the case, right? They also delayed responding to Izzo's counsel when they inquired about the non-existent affidavit. Finally, plaintiff's counsel seemed at times to forget its role as counsel for the putative class. As one example, plaintiff's counsel broadcast a private disagreement between an absent putative class member and counsel. As another, they repeatedly failed to serve objectors. These issues were also a net negative on the progress of this litigation. The burnt reputational capital in this action warrants a downward adjustment to the fee award. Good. In these circumstances, it is within the court's discretion to reduce class counsel's fee award. Plaintiff counsel is awarded fees and expenses of 12%. So they were asking, what, between 15 and 27%? And she gave them 12. Take that, BLBG. Then they get their 5000 plaintiff, uh, this would be Allegheny, gets their $5,000 award to Mr. Franchi and to Allegheny for their time and trouble. Izzo's request for a, we're almost done. Izzo's request for a stay pending appeal is denied. Having approved the settlement, I now turn to Izzo's motion seeking a stay such that the status quo order remain in, remain in place pending an appeal to the Supreme Court, which Ms. Izzo states is forthcoming. Plaintiffs and def uh, defendants responded late July opposing the request. Izzo filed a reply on July 31st. Uh, 
Uh, she's going to go through the Kerpat factors. First one being whether the litigant seeking a stay has demonstrated a likelihood of success on appeal. Likelihood of success will be shown if the party seeking the stay has presented a serious legal question that raises a fair ground for litigation and thus for more deliberative investigation. The only issue Izzo identified for appeal concerns whether the release is properly interpreted as encompassing future claims. The July 21st opinion rejected her argument, reasoning that her reading misinterprets the release, which included two limitations that make clear the release does not apply to future events. Uh, therefore, her motion is insufficient to establish a fair ground for litigation and thus for more deliberative investigation. So no to the first Kerpat factor. As for the second one, Izzo claims she will suffer irreparable harm if a stay is not granted. Approval of the proposed settlement will lift the status quo order. Once the status quo order is lifted, the company is free to effectuate the reverse split and conversion. And I read the defendant's July 26 letter as expressing an intention to do so as quickly as possible. Post-conversion, the converted shares will be freely traded on the New York Stock Exchange and will change hands before a final appellate will likely change hands before a final appellate decision is rendered. She's saying even uh, if Izzo files an appeal, it's already going to be trading post reverse split. It will as a practical matter be difficult, if not impossible to unwind those transactions. If our Supreme courts find that the release is over broad, but the harm to the company and the stockholders would be even greater if this action is stayed pending appeal. So the third Kerpat factor weighs heavily against issuing a stay. The defendants anticipate the company will have to raise additional capity through capital through equity sales to stave off bankruptcy and remain in compliance with its loan covenants. As explained above, AMC's second quarter financials reveal a continued need to sell equity to raise cash despite recent earnings. Again, this is from the judge. Has any YouTuber other than me, maybe Bigums, told you guys this stuff? You got 40 people telling you the exact opposite. The judge disagrees politely with all of those YouTubers and those objectors on Twitter. Company's second quarter financials reveal a continued need to sell equity to raise cash despite recent earnings. Lifting the status quo order enables the consummation of the reverse stock split and conversion, which will free up additional common stock for sale. If the company filed for bankruptcy before an appellate decision was issued, both the common stockholders and ape unit holders would suffer a complete loss of their investment. If the transactions are not completed, the company may have to sell additional apes. That was what we were talking about the other day. Like if this settlement wasn't approved, AMC might have to go file to, you know, register some more of those preferred shares and create more ape. Uh, which, as I've been telling you guys, would harm AMC stockholders. All these guys on YouTube, why don't they just sell more ape? It's fucking going to hurt you and your AMC because you're selling more votes. You're giving away more ownership of the company for pennies on the dollar relative to the, the value of your AMC share. Do you really want more institutions to get votes over control of this company? because you don't understand what is what you're talking about. You're you're advocating they sell more ape for a buck or dollar 50 and crush your ownership of your $5 AMC shares by giving those institutions more cheap votes. You're so narrow in your thought that you can't understand what you're suggesting is lunacy. You do not want to sell more ape. Isn't it bad enough what already happened? But they're so focused on the Moass, just sell more ape if you got to. No, you will be screwed. 
you'll be screwed in that because you're giving ownership of the company to some institution for a fifth of the price of your AMC share. And guess what happens on the next vote? Whatever you want to happen is definitely not happening then. So let's just stop talking about selling more ape. That is, there's no good outcome for that. Not for the company, not for AMC common stockholders. All right, turning to the last Kerpat factor, which is whether the grant of a stay would favor the public interest, Izzo argues an appeal will raise at least one and likely several important questions the Delaware Supreme Court should have the opportunity to consider. Judge Zern says, I disagree, Ms. Izzo. The only issue in it identified by Izzo is whether this court should have interpreted the release as encompassing claims based on future events or conducts. Izzo has failed to identify any public interest that would be served by granting a stay. Izzo has failed to show a likelihood of success and the company and its stockholders would face substantial harm if a stay were granted. So her motion is denied. So that's it. For the foregoing reasons, proposed settlement is approved. Plaintiff's counsel are awarded 12% fee and their bonuses. Um, wh what is next is the final judgment where she will close this case out and, uh, and lift the status quo order. If I am understanding correctly, what's coming up next. Let me get some, get some light over here. I will put the link to this document in the video description when we finish up here. Uh, I've already posted it elsewhere, but if you haven't been, ab been able to find it and you want to read <laughs> 110 pages on your own, I, I, I think it would be good. I think it would be good for all of you to read it. But if you don't, I understand. In fact, uh, I'll drop a link right now in the chat, and then I'll put it in uh, the video description also. Hang on, let me carefully highlight here. All right, what other questions, guys, before we wrap up? Uh, AMC Ape Pittsburgh. I don't have a Discord link because our Discord is not open. It's not a drop-in, drop-out Discord. I do have a, what I call an inconvenience fee. It's five bucks, like 30 cents a day, to keep out trolls, meme posters, hopium dealers. Uh, our Discord is for traders. And if I had it free, it would get overloaded with spam. So I don't just hand out the Discord. It is available for free to anybody that is supporting this channel. So either through Patreon or a, a YouTube membership. And the, the lowest, the cheapest of those is $5. I tried to make it reasonable. Uh, once you, if you hit the join button on YouTube, then go to Discord and make sure your YouTube channel is linked in Discord, your Discord, go to your settings, connections, link your channel, and my Discord will automatically sync up. I don't talk about it a lot. I'm not here to push a Discord, but uh, when I'm not on camera, that is where I'm at, talking with the members of the channel, answering questions, and literally for the past couple months, we've been doing that shit 15, 20 hours a day. So... If you think $5 is a lot for 20 hours a day of my time, I can assure you and my wife can assure you it's not. <laughs> if yes, Woodstock says it must be a relief to be out of this play. The biggest relief that I have Woodstock, uh, I, I love the company. I'm going to go see a movie this weekend 
I still have not seen uh, Oppenheimer because IMAX has been sold out, sold out, sold out. So I want to see that this weekend. And I will continue to spend an obscene amount of money on concessions and drinks. Uh, I'll look for opportunities to get back into the trade when it is appropriate. And I'll let you all know. Um, I want everybody to be successful in this, whatever your choices are. And last week or into the coming weeks, I'm not going to be debating or arguing with people about stuff. You're going to hear a lot of lies and smears and nonsense. But at the end of the day, this money that I've had in this play has been sitting there for two years. And the amount of time that I'm focusing on this, trying to get you guys factual information has taken up an obscene amount of my day, preventing me from making money on other trades. And, uh, you know, at some point that has to end. So we will be talking going forward about uh, a lot more momentum trades and other long-term profitable companies, you know, your, your Costco's and your Amazon's, that ilk, and then the daily plays. I mean, there are people in the Discord every day that are making money, day trading stuff, momentum trading, that whatever is running that day. And uh, so we'll be, we'll be doing more of that too. Back to what I was doing before all of this began. What lawsuits may appear after the final judgment, Mr. Sasquatch? Uh, I don't know. I'm sure they have some planned. I'm sure I, I, I'm hearing that they're planning an appeal. So it's still anybody's guess, right? I, I can't say lock tight 100% this is done but I'm pretty sure it's done. We'll, we'll have to see what else they come up with, but the settlement is approved for all intents and purposes. We're waiting on the final judgment letter from the judge. Shen says, uh, make the t-shirt I wrote up. Okay, let me, let me scroll up. Cowboy hat, cigar, the skull shot glass with the text. If it makes a profit, it makes sense. I like that. One of my, uh, one of my good friends had a saying, if it ain't sexy, don't do it. I, I wish we could figure out some way to come up with something like that for this channel. If it ain't profitable, don't do it. How about that? He, the guy that I was talking about was a salsa instructor. And man, I tell you what, the ladies, they loved that phrase. He'd end every class with, if it ain't sexy, ladies don't do it. And they just swoon. He didn't even have to try. He didn't even have to try. Super Steven. What's up, amigo? Did Tony say the status quo order is not lifted? I'm, I'm pretty sure that the status quo order will be lifted when she enters the final judgment. I didn't see anything. It, it was confusing to me in here. It said when the settlement is approved, that I read that right up here somewhere. Uh, when the settlement is approved, it will lift the status quo order. But I think, and I could be wrong, I'm not an attorney. Feel free to correct me or add your own thoughts. I think that it requires the final judgment to lift the status quo. I, I didn't see anything in here. Maybe we should go back and read the status quo. What do you, you, you guys tell me, what do you think? Do we need to wait for the final judgment? Stream Benji says, did, did anyone see the after hours price action? A couple of us did. Papa Max says, what percentage of your viewers do you expect will leave due to this decision? Leave what, Papa Mac? Leave the AMC play? 
Volvox says, how did that whiskey do ya? Uh, it did me great. It's good to have a celebration night. Felt great when I woke up. Woke up this morning around 6. Had a couple glasses of water. No Tylenol necessary. How do we know it's not the final judgment? Uh, it would. There's nothing entered on the docket as a final judgment, Jeffrey. Not that I saw when I checked this morning. How many of my followers do I expect will leave my subscription to this channel? Is that what you're asking, Papa? I'll lose a few to the channel. That's fine. There's going to be so many more other topics. It's going to bring in a whole, uh, a whole new population of people to this channel. We've been very, we've been very capped on ability to grow the channel because I've been stuck talking about one thing. The channel will enter a more rapid growth phase once I start talking about other topics. Do I think the short start closing positions? Uh, I don't think that anything right now, right now, tomorrow, next week, nothing has fundamentally changed that will make these shorts get out. What I have been telling you guys is when AMC has the ability to raise capital, fixes the balance sheet, and get some profitable quarters, that starts ruining the short thesis. But these are steps that have to happen. It's not going to happen overnight. How would a Fed pivot affect this play? If the Fed starts decreasing rates, we're going to, you know, that is what all of us traders in the equities market really, really want to see. All right. Uh, I usually give people a lot of leeway to comment, but once they start insulting folks in the chat, then they get booted. So Volvox, adios. Johnny B says, the impression I got was you had a small portion as a long-term hold for recovery. Talking about AMC, I, at, if there is dilution, Johnny, and if the price falls after dilution, and if I see some big institution buying in at a lower price, I will follow the big money. The smart play in this deal, let's be real, the smart play in this whole last year that we've been in was anybody that bought with Antara when it dropped below 70 cents. If you followed the big money in this play, you're sitting gangbusters right now. So I will be watching for big money to enter the play if there's dilution and if the price drops. And I will be monitoring the actor strike and AMC's ability to post profits and stem the bleeding. So there's a lot of factors that will go into it. Uh, for me to have a long-term, another long-term hold. I'm not ruling it out, but in the meantime, I will be looking for momentum opportunities. What was I celebrating, Brandy? Uh, the, I was celebrating the settlement being complete. Celebrating having to listen to people for six months tell me I'm wrong you know, that it was never going to happen. And, it, you know, to be right sometimes in investing, you just need to be patient. And I'm very patient. So I just had to deal with all that nonsense and bite my tongue for the most part, knowing that eventually we were going to be right. And now, now that's done. So we move on. Steven, yes, I scaled out of AMC at a loss back when it ran up uh, last quarter to six bucks. But uh, keep in mind, guys, I, I was in the fortunate position, if this is your first time here, that I was never going to be red on this play ever, even if it went to zero, because of the money I made buying call options in May of 2021 and selling them into the run-up in June of 2021. 
there was after that large amount of money that I made then, there was zero chance that I would ever lose money on this play if you count that money. So yes, I sold my AMC at $6 a few months ago and took a loss on those shares, but then I immediately rolled all that money back into the company in Ape, still a shareholder, at $1.50. And we hoped for a run on Ape to three bucks. Didn't go that high, but uh, I made the executive decision to exit on announcement of the settlement. Kevin, what's up? Free from it all. Today's email from AMC Investors Club was a kick in the teeth. I didn't see that one. <laughs> they, they gave everyone a free popcorn? Shit. Uh, Dead Like Me says, when they merge Ape to AMC, how is the price calculated? You're going to take the floats. You're going to take the market cap. Let's, let's put up that spreadsheet one more time for those of you who haven't seen this before give me one second all right what was our price 219 and 3 392 and 219. So 392, 219. So right here is what we're looking at. Uh, the post reverse split price, 28 bucks. And then you, I did not in my model here include the award of extra shares of AMC that will dilute this float a little bit more. So take $1 off of this $27 roughly will be the uh, conversion price. If we were using Fridays after market close of 392 and 219 around 27 bucks. And then as soon as trading starts happening, that all can change, right? This, you know what happens when that bell rings in pre-market or whatever, you know, if they start trading at the opening bell, it's gonna start moving. So this just gives you a goalpost to know where it's gonna start. If next week AMC and APE go up, uh, this price will go up. You can see before the market, you know, before the judge's decision, this part of the spreadsheet pulls the live price. Uh, we closed at 526 and 178. That would have been a post reverse split of 2969. So if the prices drift back up next week, this price will be higher. But what I want you to look at is $5.26 post conversion, your AMC shares are going to drop to $2.90 six cents times 10 for the re reverse split. I know there's not a lot of people explaining this to you. I've done my best over the past few months to explain the arbitrage and the conversion, what was going to happen to your AMC shares. That's why it fell on Friday because in the conversion, you're going to lose a lot of value on those shares. Ape will go up. But, you know, where we're at is actually over here now. We're at 392 and 219. Yeah, these, this right here uh, uses a script to pull the live price, but since the market's closed, uh, this was the end of trading regular hours on Friday. This half of the spreadsheet, I can just type in whatever I want. So I typed in the after hours price.
Kevin says, I heard it might not be a 10 for one anymore. It might be as low as a seven for one. Yeah, we'll have to see. I, I don't know about that. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people putting out hopium opinions, ideas, theories. We'll see. Uh, I, I won't be talking about that till I see a press release or an 8K. Just like uh, when Mullen announced theirs on a press release, I still waited for an extra day for the 8K because I, I never trust these guys till I see the SEC filing. All right, we're at 1.30. We've been going two and a half hours. I could use a break. Drop any questions you have down in the comments after the video's over, and I'll try and get to them. Thank you for your time. Uh, I wish everybody the best. And uh, there's going to be a lot of volatility. A lot of, I don't know if it's going to be volatility moving the price, but there's going to be attempts at volatility next week. So tighten your, your belts. Good luck to those of you that are staying in. Good luck to those of you that, that are going to make some trading out next week. And, uh, and we'll see where we go from here. Join me tomorrow night with Markets for May. If you want to know more about the AMC debt and what her thoughts are on, are they likely to pay any of it off? Or is there a smarter decision? This is May's wheelhouse. This is kind of her area of expertise, way more than me. And I'm curious to hear uh, what she's going to say. And I think you guys might learn something from that too. So join us tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Bring your questions. We'll be doing it live. Thank you guys. Enjoy your weekend. I'm coming.